Hi, my name is Esteban and uh, I'm a Python developer. I mostly do uh, full stack uh, web development and, and DevOps. But as of lately, probably the last uh, two years, I've been doing a lot of uh, data engineer work as well. And uh, currently I'm, I'm the senior software engineer at, at Fanalytical, where we help support teams enhance they, their ticket sales and, and uh, enlarge their, their donation database. And uh, if you want to find me, I'm Megabancho everywhere. So basically you can find me as Megabancho in Twitter, in GitLab, GitHub, LinkedIn, literally everywhere. So when I started working at uh, Fanalytical, one of the things that uh, really shocked me a bit was uh, that people were talking all the time, dude, my, my, my data is, is bigger than yours, right? Uh, I found this funny because everybody was talking about big data and how big the data was and so on and so forth. So I started digging a bit and uh, really looking at what, what really was uh, big data, right? Uh, this is kind of an academic um, uh, definition that I found online, uh, but I, I like it quite a lot. So it says uh, big data are high volume, high velocity, and or uh, high variety information assets that require new forms of processing to enable enhanced decision making, insights, discovery, and processing optimization. Right, this is a definition like any other, but if we if we dig a bit deeper on 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 the definition, basically we we understand that is uh, big data is not mainly about the size of the data, but it's about these, uh, what, I, what, what is called sometimes the three Vs, right? So it's about volume, so the amount of data that you actually have, how many gigabytes, how many terabytes you have. It's about the velocity, so it's the speed of the data coming into your system and coming out of your system. And it's also the variety of your data, right? So the range of types and sources that you are reading uh, for, your, uh, for your system. Uh, reading at, or looking at this, um, Three points. Uh, chances are that you don't. Uh, your, your data is not big after all, right? And and that's not a bad thing. So don't worry. Stay with me. So there are a few problems that are in, in my humble opinion there are a few problems uh, with big data solutions, right? So uh, first of all, and foremost is that they are expensive. Uh, they need a specialized profile. So finding somebody to work there is not only difficult but it's also expensive again. And there are some commercial solutions out there either free or, or like open source or uh, commercial software that you have to, to pay for. But all of them, they tend to, to tie you in and it's very difficult to move from one to the other or, or change if you, if you don't like them. So if, if you see where I'm going, is basically that uh, not working with big data is, is a good thing. Or in my opinion, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing actually. I kept on digging on this uh, size of, of the data and uh, I found this uh, interesting uh, website where they, uh, they define uh, small big data, right? And they have this uh, manifesto there, you can check the, the URL, it's quite, quite interesting. Um, one thing that resonates with me is basically the second point there that says that unless you are Google, or in this case, uh, Facebook, Amazon, or one of these, or one of those uh, big guys in the, in the play, uh, chances are that your data is not that big in the end, right? And, and again, that, that's, that, that's good. So for me, small big data is something that usually fits in, in your computer. So usually, or chances are that you're gonna have a laptop with uh, 16 gigs of RAM, 32 gigs of RAM perhaps, if you're lucky. Uh, and then you're gonna have also an SSD disk uh, with 200, 200 something gigs, 500 something gigs, or, or even more. Uh, but if you wanna replicate that in the cloud, it, it might be expensive, right? And um, for these sets of data that are not big data, um, big data solutions might, might be slower in the end, right? So um, most of the cases, you're gonna spread your data around different nodes in this big data solution, and then you're gonna compute in these nodes, and then you're gonna gather in a main uh, node the, the results and so on and so forth. So you can imagine that the network latency is, is a big player there, right? So uh, I think this uh, small big data is, is something interesting and something that we should be looking more into the data engineering world. And that's why I decided to make this talk, actually. So in order to, to follow the, the talk, so basically you need to be familiar with Python. That's everything you need. Uh, we're gonna run all the examples in Python 3.8.1 in case you wanna replicate it on, on, on your installation. Uh, but anything above 3.6 should be enough. 
uh, if you don't know how to install Python, uh, there are many, many tools, like Homebrew, PyM, from whatnot. And there is this nice article in, in uh, realpython.com that you can take a look and, and it will help you install Python in your machine, no matter what operating system. All the code examples that I'm, I'm going to show you today can be found on, on my GitHub uh, account in this, in this URL. And um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about editors. Anyone can, can choose their own. I'm, I'm use, personally, I'm using Emacs. Uh, so the, the objectives of this, of this talk. Um, so we want to enhance memory consumption and the speed for uh, primarily for our um, ETL pipelines. Uh, usually speed and memory consumption, they come uh, together. So less, uh, for example, less uh, garbage collection uh, events is more speed, less memory, um, less pagination means more speed, less memory as well. So they, they go hand by hand. hand. Uh, and then um, readability is as much important as the speed long term. So if you have an improvement of 1%, or if I find an improvement that is 1% only, but the code is, is much more difficult to read, I, I will not uh, put that into production because I know that future me is not going to understand what I did and I'm going to spend more time in the end. Uh, we're going to try to avoid anti-patterns as much as possible. And this relates to the, to the previous point. Um, then before, I, I would suggest that before uh, making something more efficient, we make it work. We find the, the bottlenecks and we make those bottlenecks more efficient. And uh, we won't cover uh, garbage collection or C memory allocation or all these uh, details, even though I would love to, but we just have a half an hour, right? Um, so Python already offers us as a language, offers us a lot of um, freebies, things that we can use without actually installing any, any library. So the first one that I'm going to talk to you about is not actually uh, some functionality of the language, but it's also it's, it's more of a pattern that everybody uses uh, with with Python, right? So it's uh, this ask for forgiveness, right? So most of the times it's slower to actually check something than try to do it. Um, when I say most of the times, it's usually the the most common case, right? Uh, because you need to be aware that handling exception is more expensive than actually uh, an if else block. And let me demonstrate that with an example. So we have two classes, A and B. A has an attribute A and B has an attribute B. And then we have two functions that they do something with uh, the attribute A. So the first one checks if the object has the attribute A. And the second one does assume that the, the object has the attribute A. And if it doesn't, raises an exception and catches the exception, right? At the bottom of the, of the slide, you can see the, the, the results of uh, running this over a list. I think it was a million objects. In the first case, the, the list is, is made out, out of mostly A's, in which case it's, it's much faster to do something without asking. So handling the exception, the, the price of handling the session is, is, uh, is much smaller compared to actually asking every time if the object has the attribute A. And bear in mind that the, the fact that we are asking for one attribute, it, uh, the time that this this is uh, that we spend on that it, it grows with the number of attributes, right? So imagine that you need to ask for ten different things; they will be much higher. But on the other hand, if the list is made out of uh, B's mostly, it's much faster to actually check if the object has the attribute A before actually doing something. And this is uh, something that you need to be aware of when you are doing this this type of of patterns when you are iterating over a list. In this example, it's, it's quite simple to see that, but sometimes it can get uh, very, uh, very difficult, but improvements are, are, are big if you look at the, at the numbers here. So the, the, next, um, the next thing that uh, Python offers us is something that is called uh, iterator, generator, and generator expressions. These uh, three uh, things, they, they try to, to maintain new memory, what is really, really necessary at a given moment in time. So basically, uh, if you have a list and you want to iterate over it, it will maintain only one object of the list instead of the entire list in memory. So imagine that you have your ETL, right? So you're going to have your extract function, your transform function, and your load function. So in here, I have two, two examples, two dummy examples for the, for the extract and transform, transform functions. So the extract basically gives a, a random number between uh, minus 1,000 and 1,000 for 1 million times, right? And this is already a generator, which means that it doesn't maintain a million numbers in memory at a given time. The transform function is the, the fizz-buzz algorithm, right? So uh, you can read through the logic, but it's basically 
if the number is divided by uh, if is divisible by five, then it returns a uh, buzz. If it's divisible by three, fizz. And if it's uh, by three and five, it returns a uh, fizz buzz. And if nothing of that uh, applies, then it returns the, the, the string representation of that number. Okay. Now, if we run that using uh, normal lists, so you see that uh, from the generator that I showed you before, I'm creating an actual list that contains a million objects, and then we transform that and create another list. In that case, we use 75 megs of RAM, and it takes 1.29 uh, seconds, which is kind of a lot. And this is something that we want to avoid. So the second example in, on the left is basically taking advantage of the generator, and it only maintains in memory one object from the generator and the entire li transform list. In this case, if you look at the, at the right now and you see the, the results, the, the amount of memory is almost reduced by half. The time is a bit less, but it's, it's not significant in this case. The last example is an interesting one. In this case, we, we create a, a generator expression and uh, the generator expression by itself, it doesn't consume memory because nothing is happening there until you call next. You call next and one of the then extract is called, it yields one of the integers, transform is called, it runs fizzbuzz on this integer and gives you the result back. So in this case, we are going to have only one object in memory, which is 0 0.01 max. The, the amount of time here is not significant because I, I have to be honest with you, I'm, I'm cheating a bit because in this case, I'm just processing one object, right? But imagine that you would um, send the process data somewhere one by one. In the above examples, you will have to iterate over the list and send it, right? So here you could start sending it from the beginning, which is, it is, it is kind of interesting, especially if you want to uh, use the next, next uh, technique that you can, that Python is offering you that I'm gonna show you, which are the threaded uh, multi-processing, multi-threading and async IO, right? So unfortunately, Python is single thread, which means that most of, in most of the setups, um, the, the system is gonna be underused. So you have a machine with multiple cores and so on, only one of them is gonna be used. Uh, but parallelism can lead to horrible headaches, uh, believe me, uh, like, 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 used to, uh, like we used to say, been there, done that, right? So there is the, the guild that you need to deal with, there are the race conditions that you are not gonna like, there are the deadlocks that you're gonna even like less. And there are more, other, or more or any, there are a lot of other things that uh, can happen with, with threads. But I, I have to say that if you use them with caution, they can lead to big improvement, right? So especially if you, are, if you are reading from a source that is slow or you're reading from a, a foreign disk or something like that, uh, you, can, you, can take, you can take advantage of things like a sync IO. So imagine in the previous example where we have the, the transform, that our transform uh, is uh, slightly slower because it needs to do some sort of reading from somewhere. Uh, I don't know. So I'm, uh, so the, the, the first example is an async function that it is basically waiting for the I.O. to happen. And the second one is a normal function that is uh, actively waiting for the uh, I.O. to happen, right? So here you see that the, the speed improvements are really, really huge in this case. This is a toy example, but imagine in your uh, ETL, what will happen if you are waiting for, uh, I don't know, waiting for uh, something to come from, from a disk, and while you're doing that, you can do something else, which is basically what async IO allows you to do. And same goes for multi-processing and multi-threading. For me, those are the three main themes that uh, Python has that can help you enhance your uh, small, big data pipelines. There are other things that you can use, like uh, uh, or, or you can uh, take profit of, like for example, the speed of f strings is much higher than the speed of uh, formatted strings. Uh, when you if you need to check for types, uh, you should use instance of instead of type because it's, it's, it's as well faster. And there are other smaller things, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave on the on the GitHub page some uh, some links to, to some interesting blog articles where you can read uh, read about all that. Um, now, moving on, we are going to talk about what I'd like to call the use of suspects. So those are libraries that uh, you will find most likely in every other ETL pipeline that will help you write a better and more efficient uh, code. So typically what you have is, uh, I would say in 90% of the cases, 
uh, NumPy and Pandas. Uh, they are both implemented in C and, and they are both uh, um, implement vectorized operations, which allows them to do really, to, to, to get really uh, high speed uh, on certain operations and, and uh, be really efficient in terms of memory as well. But as I said, there are other libraries that can help you write better, um, more efficient ETL pipelines. And let, let's, let's check out a, a few of them. So the first one is a bit of uh, controversy here. So it's SQL Alchemy. So it's an object relational mapper, an ORM, which basically allows you to map Python objects into uh, database objects or database tables, right? As everything has pros and cons. So for me, the main, uh, the first pro is basically that is uh, is Python and not SQL. Not everybody is is uh, uh, an SQL pro, and I think this is a good thing. Is uh, DB agnostic, so you, tomorrow you have to migrate databases. It will help you with that. Uh, many queries will perform better because, as I said, I'm not a, an SQL expert, so this will help me with that. It will prevent SQL injection, which is a really good thing. Uh, and then there are some advanced features that you actually don't need to care about that much. It will handle a connection pool for you. It will help you with the migrations. If you have polymorphism in your data, it will, it will also help you with that uh, and, and, and more. And it also has a few cons. The, the, the biggest one is speed. So it's going to be slower, period. Uh, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. As I said before, readability for me is more important than uh, speed. Uh, it also has a, a, a small overhead in the initial configuration. So you need to set up your connection. You need to uh, be familiar with the, with the library itself, the API, and so on. You need to set up your basis for the models, and so on. So it has a little overhead. And indeed, some, some queries might perform worse. If you are a SQL guru, you might write a really uh, better performing queries. Um, that being said, SQL Alchemy allows you to run uh, raw SQL if, if you are so inclined to. So let me show you an example of, of uh, SQL, work, SQL Alchemy working. So we have the typical customer with an ID and a name. Uh, I, I said that for, for this example, I'm using a million customers. And then uh, first thing that I'm trying to do is basically yeah, at the bottom, you'll see this is uh, saving them with uh, plain SQL to an SQLite database in my machine. And this do 1.7 seconds. So it's really fast, it's SQL, we know it's fast. Then uh, using the, the object that I have at the beginning, I'm using the ORM, typical ORM uh, flow, where we uh, create an object and do a session and commit the session takes 42 seconds to do, the, to do the same thing. So it's way more than uh, plain SQL, right? But in the, in the last line of, of the, of the uh, at the bottom, we see that uh, SQL Alchemy has what they call the bulk operation. So they have bulk insert and bulk update. When you do this, this operation, you reduce the time quite significantly uh, compared to basic ORM uh, flow. In this case, it's 5.9 seconds, uh, which is more than the uh, plain SQL. But again, I, I think in this case, we, it's a, it's a trade-off that we can make. And uh, another thing that is important here is if, if, you, uh, if you assign, if you can assign uh, primary keys, for example, uh, the inserts and the updates, well, you need to assign for the updates, so the inserts will be much faster in the end. And that is also important because you can do uh, for this, uh, if you see here, I'm, I'm doing it in chunks of, of 10,000. So one thing you could do is you can send these uh, chunks, these insert chunks to, to a thread somewhere. I'm not saying asyncio because I think I don't think SQL Alchemy is, is compatible with asyncio, but you could create a spawn a thread, uh, let it run there, and continue processing your data and save another ten thousand and so on and so forth. The next library that I'm going to show you today is uh, is called Namba, and it's a just-in-time compiler, a JIT compiler. So what it does is basically it, it uh, parses your uh, Python code and then it transforms that into a uh, 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 compile code that is much faster than that to interpret than, than Python, right? Uh, the main pro that I have for, for Namba is that it's really easy to use. So you just drop the add G to the decorator and your function is immediately pre-compiled. It uh, has automatic parallelization with the add vectorized decorator. So if you have a function that is meant to run over a list, but you're doing a for loop over the list and applying the function, 
you can say add vectorize and pass the the the, the NumPy array for example, and it will it will actually run like that. That connects to the next uh, pro, which is the the support for NumPy. It has really good support for NumPy, and if you are so inclined to, it has GPO support as well. It has a downside like everything, so it's really 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 difficult to debug. So you find if you find um, an error, is if it's a, a bit difficult to pinpoint where the error is happening and why it's happening. Uh, there is no way to interact with with Python and its module in the non-Python mode, which makes sense. But again, it's there, and it has limited support for classes. But if you have a a use case where you do a lot of numerical calculations in your ETL, you will really benefit from that. Like in this example. So say that you have to, you, in your ETL, you need to calculate the distance between two points, right? So this is the function that calculates the distance without numby takes 2.5 seconds, and with numby takes 0, 0 0.3 seconds. If you look at in GitHub as, at the code, the difference between the two functions is the JIT decorator. That's it. Easy. Uh, the last library is uh, Dask. We love Dask at Fanalytical. So it's uh, basically a general purpose parallel programming solution that scales uh, familiar analytic tools like uh, NumPy, Pandas, and Scikit-Learn. So I said that we love Dask basically because they don't try to reinvent the wheel. So there is a really established API, like the Pandas API, and they basically re-implemented that in a parallel way. So if you look at the examples here at the bottom of the slide, basically the, the first three lines are importing a CSV, or sorry, reading a CSV file and calculating the mean on the distance. And the, the, the last three lines are doing exactly the same, but with Dask. I think the only difference, the only two differences are the import statement and the dot compute at the end. So uh, my colleagues on the, on the machine learning side, they, they love this because they can scale their uh, they, uh, their pipelines much better than what they could be doing before with just pandas on a single machine or even single thread. Uh, we use Dask uh, for many things, but the, the one that uh, was kind of our success story was to find the customer duplicates and merge them. So what we do here is basically we extract the data, uh, we connect to our, to our external sources and we extract all the customer ac account information from there and we do that in a daily basis. We, we save that uh, to uh, temporary files, uh, transform already into our schema, and then we basically merge this new data with the, the data that we already have in our system. And then finally, we basically extract from all the customer information, the new and the old, we extract the matching information and we group using that matching information. So most of the time it's email would be used. Um, we group and we apply a function on the grouping, and that's it. And then we save the results into uh, our finalized data, our process data, and then we go from there. So I say that this is our success story because basically when, when I started working at Fanalytical, we needed a machine that was 32 gigs, uh, that needed 32 gigs of, of RAM to accommodate all the data pipelines. And then now we are down to 8 gigs of, of a machine that has 8 gigs. We went from one day for processing the income data for our largest client down to three hours, and now we are at 30 minutes with all the improvements that I, I've been sharing with you all along the slides. And um, as I said, we love Dask, and one of the reasons is that we have a smaller uh, AWS bill nowadays. So we processed all the data already we have it in our system. So the next natural step there is to extract features, right? And that's where the feature store comes into place. So what is a feature store and why do I need a feature store? So for me, it's like a data warehouse, but instead of storing your raw data, you're storing features for machine learning, right? Um, I read somewhere that 80% of the data science work is basically data wrangling and extracting these features. So it's really precious work that you need, that you want to store somewhere and be able to replicate it. And uh, in our case, many of the fields that we are calculating are used in, in several models. So uh, being able to read them, calculate them once and read them many times, it, it was an important thing for us. Then it, it, since we are using that, we've seen a better collaboration since we're using a feature store. 
um, we've seen a better collaboration between team members, especially when uh, sharing fields. Because before I was calculating a field this way, my colleague was calculating a different way and we were getting different results. Now there is only one way, standardized way for all the team. And if you do version, it will allow you to do uh, auto-identify data drift quite easily uh, from the features. And uh, it's something that there are many companies using. The, I think one of the first was uh, Uber with uh, Michelangelo, but this is a, a closed uh, solution, so it, you can, I don't think you can use it. There are many other solutions like Hop, Hop's work, uh, um, Feast, and so on, others. But all of them have the same problems and many other data, big data solutions that you need all these uh, Hive clusters, uh, Apache Spark clusters, uh, Hadoop, and so on and so forth, which can be expensive in the end. So what we did is we, uh, we tried to do our opinionated implementation. And for that, we, we use existing, existing and inexpensive tools like uh, Parquet Files, Dusk, and AWS Athena. Uh, we mostly use it for offline usage, uh, but it shouldn't prevent you from using it for uh, online usage as well because the amount of data that it needs to read is not that big. And there is no public release, unfortunately, just yet. We are uh, fine tuning a few things and roughing and uh, softening a few rough edges, but it will come. Stay tuned for that. So, our, in, our implementation started with uh, our idea of the consumer high level API. Uh, so the first block of code basically is how you would calculate all the features that we extract from the customer. And the second block is how uh, my colleagues at the machine learning side of, of, of the pipeline will read the feature from the feature store, right? So you can you get the group. In both cases, you get the group. In one, you calculate, and the second one, you get the features that you want. You exclude them or you exclude some and so on and so forth, and you can actually apply filters as well. And this will give you back a, a dask data frame. So behind the scenes, what is happening is basically that we have a, a set of functions that uh, will query our, our data warehouse, apply some functions like the instance that I showed you before, and in this case it's uh, using lat and long, it's a bit more complicated, but uh, you, you, get the, you get the point. And then uh, it, will, it will return a, a dask data frame. And in order to tell our feature store what fields it's going to calculate, the type and the function that it's going to use. We have this uh, configuration object uh, where we have, as I said, the, in this case, the distance field with the type float. And then we have a function that like, is uh, like an import string that is going to tell our feature store where to look for the function to calculate some of the features. Once we have the functions and the, and the configuration ready, what we do is basically we iterate over all these functions and we create threads um, to run the calculations. Once all the as, as the threads they they are coming back, they uh, we basically merge the results. <coughs> Sorry. And finally, we just save that. This is a big, 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 really big task data frame, and we basically save it to to uh, AWS as a compressed. Uh, uh, parquet file, and that was the calculate piece. Then when we want to read, what we do is the, the second block here in the slide, what we do is um, we create an AWS Athena table, a temporary one. We point it to the, uh, the, to the uh, parquet file, and then we query that thing. Once we are done querying, we destroy the, the table because it, it costs money. So we just need it for the querying piece. And that's our implementation. So I think it's quite simple, and it, it, it actually works for, for our use case. So what we learned through, through this uh, journey that we did is that it, we are much more efficient now as a team, and we are much more efficient now in terms of, develop, of deployment resources. So we don't need to calculate the, the features every time that we run a model. Um, if I can give you a, 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 an advice, is that you start small. Basically, you can start with us. We started with a Python script with a set of function being called inside and saving the result to a CSD file. That was our, our starting point. Uh, and then we, we grow from there. If, if, if you want to do it on your own, I recommend that you start small. Uh, if you're going to use AWS, I think it'd be very in mind that it doesn't like dates. So it will store dates in a, in a format that is not the one that you expect. So if you can avoid uh, dates, uh, do so. 
And uh, yeah, it sounds very sexy when you're at a conference and you say, no, no, we use a feature store. It's really a sexy topic nowadays. So now we've seen our uh, ETL pipeline, how we calculate our features, and now let's see how we run this in production, right? So the glue that puts everything together is Airflow. And in my humble, in my humble opinion, we were using Airflow wrongly for small big data ETLs. And uh, most of us, are, I'm going to explain why. So most of us, we're, we're using uh, Celery to, to, to run the tasks. But uh, that can lead to, to a scenario where you have one task, one worker, because the, the amount of memory that this task requires is, is that big that it doesn't allow anything else to run on that worker. So you will need many, many workers. And the size of your worker, it needs to be as big as the biggest task you have, right? So if you have one task that needs eight gigs, another task that needs 32, you probably need a worker that needs, has 32 gigs. Uh, so what we, what we did uh, is basically we are running, uh, nowadays we're running Airflow on ECS and we are still using Celery. But in our case, we use also the ECS operator to start a new container for every single task on dedicated resources. So what we did is that, by doing so, our, our Celery machine now is, is much smaller and we allow for higher concurrency, right? So we can have, I think, each of our workers is doing uh, 10 tasks in parallel and it's, it's not the smallest machine in AWS, but it's the next one. Um, the costs of actually doing this, this concurrency are smaller because, as I said, you can fine-tune the resources that you need for each of the tasks, depending on the size of the of the task, right? So if you have a if you have a client with uh, ten million customers and another client with a hundred thousand customers, the size of the machines can be different depending on on that. And another um, good thing about about this uh, approach is that basically there is no client specific code deployed with Airflow, and each client is deployed independently. Uh, this leads to faster deployments. And it can help you with this dependency hell where you have a library that you use in one client and for whatever reason you use the same library in another client but a different version. If you were to put everything together in, in your salary workers, it will basically not work because you need the same library with two different versions. This uh, concludes my talk. So if I can give you four uh, things that you should take home uh, out of my talk, they are basically uh, that uh, small big data is better than big data. Uh, I do believe that I'm not going to brag ever about how big my data is because I know uh, deep inside me that I'm going to have a, an easier uh, work down the road than anyone that has uh, really big data. Um, I, I would say that uh, whenever your colleagues are, are extracting features from your data, please store them somewhere because they are really pre it's precious work what, you are, what they are doing. and. Um, it, it, will, it will help everyone down the road as well. Um, there are many tools and libraries that will help you uh, be more efficient and write more efficient code and eventually spend less money on, on, on cloud solutions. So I think you should convince your uh, manager somehow to give you two days a week or something to explore things like Namba or Dask and how they can, can help you uh, uh, in, your, in your daily operations. Uh, you should mention something about ROI or things like that. It, it will it will really resonate with them. And uh, Docker is key in all that. Uh, being able to uh, replicate uh, experiments, being able to run isolate uh, isolated uh, environments, and so on and so forth. I think is really important, especially if you if you uh, decide to to use Airflow the way that we are uh, using. If you cannot attend the Q and A session that we that will be uh, in place uh, sometime, um, I'll, I'll be happy to to answer them. If you uh, if you pin me on on the GitHub repository in the form of an issue, or you can shoot me an email. Just feel free to do it. Uh, I'm, I'm being told that I'm a nice guy. So uh, again, uh, thanks and have a good one.